Hello, I'm Dr. Jeremy Flowers, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Good News from the Great. We invite you to a time of biblical information and inspiration. We invite you to this morning's broadcast, as it's currently in progress. I don't know what y'all came here to do today in cyberspace, but obviously there are at least 11 people in here who've come to praise the Almighty God. We're thankful to all of those who constitute our praise team for uh, not just leading us in praise while we can't all be in the sanctuary, but if you haven't noticed, they've gotten better every single week. Uh, so not only is it just a demonstration, but rather it's a commitment uh, to being better vessels for God. We thank them for that on this morning. We're also thankful that God has given us yet another day to approach his throne and be able to give him the worship that he is due. A few years ago here at the Green Road Church, we did a study on worship and we defined it by the old English term of worship, meaning when we worship God, we're really ascribing to him his worth. Therefore, if he's been worth something in your life, then you cannot afford to give him a lazy and lackadaisical praise. Uh, here at the Green Road Church, we are uh, so excited and ecstatic that the angels in heaven are rejoicing over the baptism of Diana Stone. Uh, Diana actually was taught by W.B. and Yolanda in Columbus and came here and accepted Jesus the Christ. And we're thankful for her, her husband, and her children, and we look forward to seeing them uh, physically when we return to the sanctuary. Also, we want to announce that we're doing yet again another community food distribution on next Sunday. So if you are food insecure or know someone who is, please share the information. Uh, we will begin again at 2 p.m. and feed as many as we can and provide laundry detergent to as many as we can in this pandemic time. Also, for the Gray Road Church, I want you to keep your eyes and ears open on social media as well as the phone tree on this week. As leadership will be uh, delivering pertinent information to our church family as we attempt to move forward. So we'll be looking out for that information. Meet me, if you would, this morning in the Gospel according to Luke, chapter number 10. The Gospel according to Luke, chapter number 10. We'll begin in verse number 25 for contextual congruity. Luke chapter number 10, beginning there, verse number 25. There, Luke the physician chronicles the mission of Jesus the Christ and records these words. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, Jesus replied, and how do you read it? He answered and said, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do all of this and you will live. But this man wanted to justify himself, so he asked the question, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes and they beat him. And they went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by him on the other side. So too a Levite, when he had come to the place, he saw him and passed by on the other side. 
But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, poured oil and wine on his wounds. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, look after him, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense which he may have. Which one of these, he says to the lawyer, which one of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, now go and do thou likewise. If you have some time, I want to speak as the Holy Spirit of God shall lead me. From the fault, just mercy. Just mercy. Let us go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly, kind and gracious Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for what was, what is, and what will be, as long as we continue to stay faithful. Father God, be with everyone under the sound of my voice. Father, open their minds, their hearts, their spirits, their souls, and yes, even their ears to hear a word coming straight from you via your manservant. Your manservant is a sinner, so I first ask for forgiveness of my own sins. And I pray now that you will use my repentant heart, speak to me and speak through me. Father, please effectuate this word, not just in this auditorium, but continuously in cyberspace on this day. Father, bless the word. Father, bless your servant. Father, bless us all as your children. All these things we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Just mercy. I invite you on this morning to travel with me to the suburbs of Jerusalem. And there in the suburbs of Jerusalem, we don't find tranquil serenity but rather the true reality of those who claim Christianity. It's here in the scenery of the suburbs that we find a chilling crime scene. While the crime perpetuated was robbery, the greater injustice is not simply found in robbery's malice, but rather in the cruelty, callousness, callousness, and ambivalence of the righteous. We as Christians often see that which we cannot stomach. And instead of intervening for the sake of improvement, we palatably possess an ambivalence which is often synonymous to malfeasance, which can then be tantamount to the malevolence of the righteous. We, just like the preponderance of our contextual characters, are concerned enough to watch but often not Christian enough to act. It's here, contextually and canonically, that we see healing through the eyes of a physician. But be rest assured that the healing needed in America today and the healing needed in the world today is not merely a healing of the body, but rather a healing of the soul. And as we search for a cure to placate the carnal conscience, Knowing that the panacea for civilization is in the word of God as dispensed by the hands of the Christian community. Meaning that if the world is to ever become a better place, then we must in fact become better people. Say it again, Dr. Flowers. If the world is ever to become a better place, then we must in fact become better people. It's here that much of Luke's writing is original to his penmanship and germane to him displaying to us the continuously compassionate Christ. Here we find ourselves in the midst of a flurry of activity. For in Luke chapter number nine, Jesus sends out the 12, feeds the 5,000, is chronicled at Caesarea Philippi, then he's transfigured, then he heals a demon-possessed boy while encouraging our willingness as juxtaposed to his homelessness. For it's in Luke 9 
that Jesus would say that foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. But then here in Luke chapter number 10, we see him releasing and then subsequently hearing the report of the 72 disciples in relation to him sending previously the 12. And betwixt Christ's teaching on ministry and priority, i.e. Mary and Martha. Here Christ points us toward his pedagogy regarding mercy. Here in Luke chapter 10 verse number 25, the Bible reads as such. On one occasion... An expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. We must see the backdrop of this as a pharisaical lawyer who's come here to test and or trip up Jesus. Notice it's this man in the midst of Christological instruction who moves from the seat of a student to the stance of a solicitor. Now, there's much debate and conjecture as to whether or not this man was meaning to be distasteful and or disrespectful in his rebuttal. Distasteful could be accurate in that the Pharisees were always trying to test, tempt, and trip up the Christ. But I also see this man not necessarily being disrespectful in his story as much as he is didactic in his dialogue. And this also was commonplace in the academia of antiquity, in that commonly the instructor and his teaching were queried as to their truthfulness and veracity. So this man gets up to test Jesus and says, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? Notice his initial inquisition reveals his thought and intention in regards to the Judaistic ideology that works produce religious and eternal reward. What must I do? Jesus answers the lawyer by asking what is written in the law. Here Christ aims to use what was said to premise what will soon be seen. So he points up to the law. And because Christ desires he is an hour conversion, he first depicts a conviction. If you want the answer to eternal life, first tell me what you know. Then you will see what I will show. What is written in the law? How do you read it? How do you interpret it, counselor? Thus proving. That Christ desires more of us than just scriptural observation, but rather scriptural application. We must do more than just read. It's amazing in Christian circles, we ask people, how often do you read the Bible? When the question ought to be, how often do you study the Bible? Too many of us are reading and not too many of us are studying. That's why the last thing we do at night before our eyes close together is we try to read the Bible. But then the next day you don't remember what you read because we desire reading more than studying. He asks the question, how do you read it? How do you interpret it? How do you dissect it? Don't just tell me what the law says, but tell me what it means. I want more than just scriptural observation. I want scriptural application. We must do more than read. For when we study, we interpret. And when we interpret, we can then apply. It's important for Jesus to get this man's comprehension so that Jesus can then give him and us future application. So the man answers Jesus and says, Sure, the law says, Love, agapeo, the Lord your God, theos, with all of your heart, cardia, with all of your soul, suke, with all of your strength, iskus, with all of your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. What do you say? Love the Lord, your God, with all of your heart, cardia, meaning what? With the center of your intellect. Love him with your soul, suke, with all of your breath. Love him with your strength, iskus, all of your ability. Love him with your mind, all of your understanding. And there's something else. Notice the and in our text. Meaning that though you love God with all of your intellect, all of your breath, all of your ability, all of your understanding, that there is yet still something else that God in fact requires. Love your neighbor 
as yourself. Here we see others and we see self put in the order of prioritization. But I believe this text also lends to us valuing self-care. Too many Christians do not value self-care. Christ wants us to care for them, yes, but to some degree, he still wants us to care for self. For an empty picture can't feel nobody. Meaning, if I love myself, then I have to love my fellow man to the same degree that I love myself. And I don't know about you in cyberspace, but Jeremy Flowers love Jeremy Flowers. Jeremy Flowers going to take care of Jeremy Flowers. Jeremy Flowers going to look after Jeremy Flowers. If don't nobody else love Jeremy Flowers, then Jeremy Flowers love Jeremy Flowers. Meaning what? The same level that I love myself, I have to love my fellow man. Some of us can't love our fellow man because we don't first love ourselves. So there's some valuation here as to self-care. It's interesting that before I love others, I must first love self. But before I love self, I must first love God. I must first love God, then I can fully love self. And when I fully love self, then I have the capacity to love others. Then meaning what? A virtual righteousness imbues a horizontal relationship. Meaning what? If I love God, then I must also love others. Give me some script with that lip. I'm so glad you asked. Come here, John. First John chapter 4, verse number 19. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is in fact a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and their sister. If I had time, I would tell you uh, that this uh, lawyer's response to the Christ is taken from the Hebraic Shema of uh, Jewish worship liturgy. I would tell you that it's really a two-part answer as he pulls from Deuteronomy and Leviticus, but we ain't got time. Jesus answered and said, well, I hear you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength and all your uh, everything else. But he says, you've answered correctly. Do this. The text says, do all of this and you will live. I hear what you're saying, but I don't yet see what you're doing. Here, this man is taken from information to comprehension. He spouted off the information and interpretation from the basis of regurgitation. But now, Jesus is going to entreat him and us to application. He came as an expert of the law, but here Christ challenges him and us to be effectuated in and by love. For what good is that which is rhetoric if it's divorced from that which is righteousness? Do all of this and live. And somebody would say, well, he should be happy because he said the right thing. And then Christ said, do all of this and you leave. He was happy that he said all the right things, but he knew that he couldn't do all the right things. He quoted the law, but he knew he couldn't keep the law. He knew all of the 600 plus things that he had to do, but he also knew that keeping all these things was impossible and improbable. It's interesting. And this lawyer knew the law, but he also knew that no one could ever do them all. He knew that to slip once was to fail. Therefore, Jesus puts the law squarely before a Jewish lawyer. And the Jewish lawyer says, I in fact cannot complete. So you would think he would be happy, but now he's convicted with the fact that I can't do all of this all the time. Even aside from the 600 plus laws, even just loving God with all of my heart and all of my mind and all of my soul and all of my strength and all of my understanding, it's hard to do that all the time for him and for us. I wish I had a church in cyberspace that said it's hard to be holy. I know I ought to love the Lord all the time with all of my being, but it don't always work out like that. Meaning what? If that's all that there is to do to be saved, I can't do that. I need some help. So what happens here is since he regurgitates the law, Christ says do that and you will live. He knows he falls short of that. He knows he's going to fail. 
He knows that through the law we'll all slip. And it's because we all slip that we are in fact in need of a savior. For the law as it was framed could not handle my failures. Therefore, it was me in my mess that needed mercy. God knowing that my mess needed to be met by his mercy sent forth a Messiah. And it's when my melanated Messiah was murdered at Calvary that his blood did meander from the floor of the cross and it gave me mercy and counted me as faithful. And it's because his mercy has made me faithful that now the faithful ought to be able to give that which they first received, which in fact is mercy. It's amazing. We had a hard time showing mercy when Lord knows we've been shown some mercy. We ought to be able to give that which we first received. Now you would think after Jesus answers him with an impossible, with an impossible ideation of always keeping the law, that he would have kept himself quiet. But no, he asked the question and Christ gives us the answer. And he asked the question in verse number 29. Well, you know, uh, I, I'm going to deflect because I can't do all of that all the time. So, uh, who is my neighbor? Remember, some think he's trying to trip up Jesus. And it's difficult to ask the simplistic question, who is my neighbor? Because Jews have often split hairs over that question. Because they never saw the Gentiles or the Samaritans or anybody who didn't look like them as their neighbor. So when he asks the question, who is my neighbor? He's hoping that Jesus will say something that in fact is radical. But he doesn't contemplate that Christ would say something that's racial. So therefore he says, who is my neighbor? I know that whatever you answer will fit into my hands. Christ says, you know what? I'm not going to answer by way of simple response. I'm not going to answer by way of simplicity, but rather by story. Now, it's interesting that he asked the question, who is my neighbor? Neighbor here is Placeon. Placeon is used over 17 times in the New Testament text. Placeon, when it talks of being a neighbor, is never directly related to one's shared ethnicity. But rather, it's always identified as simply as two or more who share space. Meaning what? Whoever our neighbor is, is not defined by color, creed, ethnicity, or sexuality. But rather, our neighbor is simply those with whom we share space. It's interesting that we have to learn that our neighbor as Christians are not just other Christians, but rather anyone with whom we share space. Irrespective of your income, your neighbor is not just those who sit upon your shared socioeconomic strata, but rather it's with whom anyone that you share space. Regardless of your complexion and coloration, your neighbor is not just those who look like you, but rather your neighbors are those with anyone with whom you share space. Therefore, we must treat all of man as our neighbor. Because we share this space known as earth and we desire to share space known as heaven. Therefore, every man and any man is my neighbor. And the same way I love myself is the same way I must love others. Even if it means going out of my way. Even if it means being inconvenienced. Even if it means going across culture lines. Even if it means being countercultural. Even if it means, okay, I ain't got time for this on this morning. It's interesting that he says, who is my name? Jesus answers in reply and gives us this story. And it's interesting that uh, we call this a parable, but never in scripture is it called a parable. Perhaps this is based off of a true story. It's interesting that Christ would use the most radical racial and countercultural instance to then speak to our conscience. You want to say that it's parabolical so you can then see it as superficial. But perhaps this rhetoric has reality, not just to them, but especially to us. He says, 
a man was going down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. We must see an Israelite, a Jew, going down this road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, it's interesting that the background tells us that this road as it traverses from Jerusalem to Jericho is over 10 miles. This road as it transcends, rather depresses from Jerusalem to Jericho drops over 3,500 feet. Meaning what? Not only is it a road that descends with rapidity, but it's also a road that is long in nature. It's also a road that is in fact dangerous. It has twists and turns and unexpected clicks and drops. Understand that this road was in fact dangerous. It was so dangerous that many at this time called it the bloody way. It was so dangerous that even the Romans built a garrison and a fort there to protect people because they knew of its danger. This road in and of itself was not even to be traveled and traversed alone. This was a road that everybody knew about but everybody had to traverse especially they were coming from the temple down to where they lived this road is long winding and dangerous with surprises and ambushes at every corner you see this road but I see our lives you see this man as a victim on the street I see a man who has fallen due to the vicissitudes of life. He's been beaten up and wounded by the causation and effectuation of life. It doesn't matter how he got here. But who of us is going to meet him there? Who of us is going to care? Who of us is going to convey him from this day to a better day? See, you see this road as winding. You see this road as dangerous. I see this life. This life is long. This life is dangerous. This life is full of surprises. This life has ambushes around every corner. This life, I go to work and I get fired on today. This life, I don't know if I'm going to get shot by the police and they are racially profiled. This life is full. I don't know what my children are going to do. I don't know what my spouse is going to do. I don't know what my health is going to do. Every time I wake up, I don't know exactly what to expect. You see this road from Jerusalem to Jericho. I see our lives. And there are people on the streets of life who are wounded who are hurting who are bleeding who are crying out and won't nobody help them especially those who call christ jesus their savior this man going from jerusalem to jericho was attacked by robbers meaning what these men were not just burglars they were robbers they were vehemently malice they, they stripped him of his clothes and stripped him of his money. Some would say, well, why in the world did he traverse this street alone? Why did he go down this road by himself? But how many of us are trying to go through life by ourselves? And we wonder why we're beaten up. We wonder why we've been wounded. We wonder why we've been mangled. We wonder why we've been manhandled. Because we've tried to traverse down this road. we tried to traverse through this life all by ourselves. He went alone. But he left with a protector. He went first alone. But he left with a healer. He left with a comforter. He left with a burden bearer. He left with a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. He left with a man who took care of his need today and tomorrow. He left with a man who not only took him to somewhere better, but said, I'm going to leave, but I'm coming back. He left with a man who said, I'll trade places with you. You can get on my donkey and I'll walk. See, I don't know about you on this morning. You might see a Samaritan, but I see a savior. I see somebody when I was traveling this life all by myself in the midst and betwixt all kind of danger who took the time to slow down, stop by, see my needs, take care of my wants, move me to somewhere better, and not only move me to somewhere better, but take care of me so I can get back on my feet because he was going to return one day and look after me. You see a Samaritan, I see a saint. Understand, if I have time, it doesn't permit itself. You see a priest and a Levite. 
I see the law and the sacrifices, neither of which stop to save the sinner. You see a Samaritan, I see Jesus, who stops to save a man, pays the bill, and promises to come again. It's interesting that the Samaritan, historically and biblically, was an outcast. He was one who helped the man, but he wasn't wanted. He was one who was willing to save those who were perishing. He was directly opposed to the religious establishment. Nobody counted him as anybody, as a Samaritan. You see a Samaritan, I see a savior. Oh, if I had time, I would go to the New Testament. And it reminds us that the one that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. You see a Samaritan who nobody looked at and believed he would do anything. I see Jesus, whose society this time looked at and didn't believe he would do anything. It's interesting that the Bible says they stripped him of his clothes and they beat him. They went away, leaving him half dead. Then it was a priest. A priest who happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by where? On the other side. Verse number 32. So too a Levi. When he came to the place, he saw him. But then he what? Passed by on the other side. But then it was a Samaritan. Let me back up. Two different people. One is a priest. One is a Levi. The preacher and the parishioner. People who should have by Christian duty reached out to one who's suffering injustice. But they walk by on the other side. And a lot of people want to try to justify this by saying, well, as the priest, he could have uh, uh, made himself ceremoniously unclean by coming in contact with this person. Number one, it's time for the church to stop wanting to not get dirty. Yeah. Some of us, we desire so much to be pious and quote unquote religiously clean that we will not get down with the common man and deal with what's really going on in society and we placate it by saying that we are those of spirituality. Honey, child, sister, girl, and brother, man, your spirituality must in some time come in contact with society. Yeah. Then we'll say, well, he had to get himself ready to, to go and stand before God. But notice he wasn't going to Jerusalem. He's going to Jericho. Perceivably, it's after church. Worship's over. But see, it's at the point where, where religion ends that spirituality must begin. Yes, it's good to go to a church at 11 o'clock in the morning, but when will we activate our faith? Yes, we go up to worship, but we come down to serve. He saw him and passed by on the other side. And if it wasn't bad if the preacher did it, here comes the preacher. Wasn't bad if the priest did it, here comes the Levite. He sees him, goes over to him, but still goes by on the other side. Every time somebody new comes, they do a little bit more, but never quite enough. The problem is, this man's hurt, this man's harm, this man's injustice is too frivolous for their faith. And that's exactly what's happening even now. In our society, we see things going on around us, and too many Christians want to look at it but not act upon it. Some of us would dare to get close to it, but we don't really want to do nothing. Some of us may even march and protest, but we won't do what it takes for systemic change. Why? Because we want to get close to it. We want to look at it. We want to say, for shame. The only thing that's for shame is that the Christian, whether the priest or the Levite, is walking on by the situation. Because they're too religious to in fact be spiritual. They won't act on their faith. And it's not just the things that are happening right now in the media. But there's so many other instances of injustice. Not just upon uh, black people but upon brown people and upon poor people. And so many things. We walk on by. Because we're too religious. 
on this road called life, there's a whole lot of folk bleeding, a whole lot of folk about to die, and we won't pick up this cause because we feel that it's antithetical to the Christian cause. When the Christian cause means that we need to stop for some of these causes so we can connect one who's half dead to one who in fact is alive. Thank God for verse number 33. And here's something weird too. God, the priest and the Levite looked like the one who was wounded. It's bad when those who don't, when those who look like you won't help you. Ain't that what's going on now? See, it's amazing that we're waiting commonly for somebody else to pick up our calls. Somebody else to help us. When we know some of us won't help ourselves. The priests saw it. The Levites saw it. But it took a colored man. It took one of darker pigmentation. It took somebody who he hated. It took somebody he didn't quite all the way religiously agree with. It took somebody outside of his social structure. It took a Samaritan to come. And the Bible says as he traveled, meaning what? He wasn't meaning to stop there. He was going somewhere else and took the time out of his agenda to deal with this man's problem. See, so many of us won't help ourselves and won't help others. We won't help the brown, the black, the poor, or anyone, because we're too busy doing what we got to do. He stopped, came to where the man walked. The priest looked at him. The, the, the Levite looked over him. But I'm so glad that somebody came down to him. Christ, through the Samaritan, came down to man. At times when the law looked over me, at times when society looked at me, it was Christ who came down to me. That's what mercy is. When I come down to you to bring you where I am, he saw something, this Samaritan, Christ Jesus, and we must today. He saw something that wasn't his problem and made it his purpose. I get so tired of folks, especially in the church, who say things like, well, that's not my problem. I would do something, but that's not my problem. When is it going to be when something that's not your problem becomes your purpose? We say things, even in the church, when well, that's his fault. He should have known better. He brought it upon himself. How dare you? And how dare I possess that mentality knowing full well we have not gotten what we really deserve? I want mercy. Therefore, I must give mercy. Somebody's been beaten and bleeding and, and bleating all along the road of life. And they demand the attention of those who call Christ Jesus their Lord. So the Samaritan came. Let me close this thing. To where the man was, saw pity on him, went down to him, bandaged his wounds, poured oil on him, and he poured wine. He saw the need and he met the need. He didn't have to call the church. He didn't have to create a program. I'm going to get ahead of myself because later on, when Jesus closes the, the, the story by saying, hey, uh, mercy is what the Samaritan showed. Now go Thou go you and do likewise. Meaning what? It's our job to not only know mercy, but to apply mercy and to disperse mercy. But also it's our job individually, not institutionally. Stop waiting on the church to do something. Stop waiting for a group to do something. It's our job individually to better the society that's around us. This man, verse number 34, he went to him. He, he, he didn't, not only did he see and meet the need, he didn't have to wait to be called upon. Yes. Yes. The man never said, come help me. Uh, when were we in Christianity to get to the point where I would have done something, but they ain't say nothing. But you saw something. If you saw something, why they got to say something? He saw the need, and he made it his call. I wasn't called. Did you see the need? Did you make it your call? 
But somebody say, well, I'm tired of all the injustices in Minneapolis and in Atlanta and in Kansas City and, and, and in Louisville, Kentucky. Well, that's all well and good. But there's enough injustice in Cincinnati that you see, but you're waiting on somebody to say something. If you see it, they make it your call. Yeah. Notice what he did. I got to close. Uh, he bandaged his wounds, poured oil on them. Why? Because here, uh, he poured oil and wine. Wine is the antiseptic. Oil is for soothing. Okay? Oil and wine. Some of y'all woke up and I said wine. Oil and wine. Now it's interesting. When it comes to the injustices poured upon the sectors of our society, we must also use oil and wine. Something to cleanse it. Something to soothe it. The problem is, in America, we're so busy trying to soothe the pain and not cleanse the wound. See, a lot of us want to use oil but not wine. No, no, child of God, we must see it even when they don't say anything. We must desire systemic and systematic change. We must cleanse the wound. Stop trying to soothe it when you ain't cleansed it. Told you three weeks ago, I said eventually, all of the pent up anger, which was valid, uh, and, and, and the protesting and the marching, it would subside. And what happened? It subsided. And now yesterday, there, there are more of the same. There are more hashtags, more Facebook, more Twitters. Why? Because we felt that when this was over, it'd be soon. But we have to cleanse the wound. Well, damn it, that never happened. Uh, racism is racism. That, that's true. But what are you doing in a small way to cleanse the wound instead of just soothe it? Okay. Then, what do you do? See, this is somebody who's willing to deal with injustice. The Christian should do this. Number one, we have to cleanse the wound. Then we can soothe and bring healing. But that's not enough. He took the man, put him on his own donkey. He traded places with him. He gave the man his seat. When we talk about doing something with injustice, I'm going to cleanse the wound. I, I, I want to soothe the hurt. But I need to put this man in an equitable position. See, when you talk about trading places, you see a Samaritan, I see a Savior. Brought him to the end. Took care of him. Verse 35, the next day, he pulled out two denarii. Some people say it's two months worth of uh, payment at the end. Gave him to the innkeeper. You see a Samaritan, I see a savior. You see a savior, I want to see a saint. I will take you from where you are. I will love you more than myself. I will give to you knowing you have nothing to give to me. I will come even though you didn't call. I will trade places with you. I will take you to a better place. I will make sure you're taken care of not just today, but tomorrow. I will give you the tools to survive today, but the tools to face tomorrow. Then he said, look here, if this is not enough, when I return, not if I return, but when I return. So therefore, I'm going to do all these things, but I'm also coming back. Oh, you see a Samaritan. I see a Savior. I'm going to do everything I can for Marvin, everything I can for Michelle, everything I can for Frankie. And even when I do everything that I can, I will not leave you alone. Yeah. I'm coming back. But also for the Christian. It's one thing to feed a man for a day. Yeah. We do well at that. But the question is, what can we get man that will satiate him for a lifetime? It's one thing to, to, to make things better today, but when you come back and check on it for tomorrow, this is how we really deal with injustice. Injustice demands mercy. Can I please close? Did he ask the lawyer again, who I'm sure eyes are bugged outside of his head, which of these three do you think he took the lawyer and turns him into a judge? Which of these three do you think he moves him from duty to love, from debating to doing? You are trying to figure out who is your neighbor. Keep on living, and you might just find out whose neighbor you are. You worry about who's your neighbor and who can you help. But honey, child, sister, girl, brother, man, keep on living. Somebody got to help you. Don't worry about who's your neighbor. Worry about whose neighbor you are. Which one of these three do you think was a neighbor? Neighbor here means the one who cares for you. Which one cared? The expert in the law said the one who had mercy. Elias, the one who had kindness, the one who had clemency. It's interesting. 
that he couldn't even murmur his ethnicity alongside his generosity. I called him a priest, Levite, Samaritan. Which one of these three? Have mercy. Well, the one who had mercy on him can't even call him a Samaritan. One must embody mercy, then exude that which we embody. Then we will stop seeing ourselves as doing a favor, but rather we will then have the compassion and pity and mercy on someone else. When we, when we do good to, to the world and in the world, it's not a favor to nobody. It's what we're called to do. We must have mercy on people and mercy on purpose. And can I tell you something? Mercy can sometimes be messy. Folk who need mercy are not those who look like us and walk like us and talk like us and think like us. No, they are people who can't do nothing for us. But until we start caring about others, it really shows we don't care about self. And because we don't care about self, it really shows we don't care about God. I'm all for mission work. I've been blessed to do it all around the world. But that means nothing if we don't do good right here in our neighborhood. The ones who need our help. What is it just our people? No, it's all people. Because there are injustices all over the world. Yeah. What do you see as being the healing for those who are hurting? It's nobody but Jesus. If perchance you are here on this morning and you are a child of God, you said you need to repent. We encourage you to do so before it's everlastingly too late. Perhaps you need prayer this morning, prayers for peace, prayers for protection, prayers for direction. Please give us your prayer request. Please email us at thegrayevents at gmail.com. Please put it on our Facebook page. Please put it in the comment box under this sermon. Or please slide in our DMs if perchance you are a child of God and you send a guilty distance away from God. If perchance you are not a child of God, you don't have a personal relationship with him. You have not yet been saved. Be saved today. Why? Because life is too short. Eternity is too long. And hell is too long. How is one to be saved? You must first hear the word of God. You've heard me out loud enough. The question is now, do you believe that Jesus Christ is a son of God? If you believe, you repent. If you believe, you'll confess. If you believe, you'll be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. So the question is, do you believe? It's a yes or no question. The answer is yes, be baptized in water. We're still baptizing. We're still baptizing. Call us. Email us. Put it in the comment box. Slide our DMs for a good reason. Will you, will you want eternal life? Do you want the one who is life? Will you do what he did to get it? Christ died, was buried, rose again on the third day. Through baptism, you mimic that same thing. You die to self, you're buried in the water, come in contact with the blood, then three that bear record in heaven, the water, the spirit, and the blood. You rise up a new creature, you receive the Holy Spirit of God. You live faithful unto them. You want to be saved? Will you reach out to us? You want prayer? Will you reach out to us? I'm so thankful for mercy. Mercy has brought me to where I am. And because I receive mercy, I must now regurgitate mercy. And my goal as a Christian is to give more mercy than I receive. And child, if you knew how much mercy I receive, I got to spend my whole life giving it out. Thank God for mercy. If you're not a child of God, mercy brought you to this point. Don't, don't, don't disenchant, don't discount God's mercy. Receive it, but do something with it. Become a child of God. If you are a child of God, you know as I know, we should be dead and gone a long time ago. Some people think that old age comes because you eat right and live, live right. Now, sometimes old age comes because God wants you to do more right than wrong. I was living wrong for 40 years and God gave me 80 years so I can get it right. Come, do what you need to do while you're still able to do it. Right now as we sing the song of invitation. We want to thank you for joining us for another episode of Good News from the Great. We invite you at your earliest opportunity to join us here at the Gray Road Church of Christ. At the Gray Road Church, you will find a biblically based, loving, and authentic body of believers in a multi-generational environment. 
We are located here in the Spring Grove community at 4826 Gray Road, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45232. Or we invite you to join us on our website, www.grayroadchurchofchrist.org. Or please join us on our Facebook page, Instagram page, and Twitter page at your earliest convenience. We look forward to seeing you grow at the gray. We've got a wonder for you today. If you're looking for the praises of God, Jesus said these sad, sad words. You've already got you. I'll tell them the story. The Pharisees stood on the streets when they prayed. They would say the same prayers over and over again. Oh. To be seen by men, Jesus said, Don't you follow in their ways, doing good deeds, seeking other men's praises. The pursuit of life is earthly fortune and fame, but in the end, it's all in vain. Jesus said, These words.